This is another edition of Issues and Answers. We're happy that you are joining us. And today we are looking at climate change and its impact, particularly on food and nutritional security. And to discuss this with me, to my immediate right, we have Mr. Steve Maxime. He's an eco-consultant. And we have a first, no stranger to this program, Mr. Crispin Duven. He's the Chief Sustainable Development and Environmental Officer. And on the far end is Mr. Critus Alexander, who is an agricultural officer. Thank you for joining us, and welcome to the program, gentlemen. I want to begin with you. Be I want to begin with you, Mr. Maxime. What brings you to St. Lucia this time around? Well, uh, I'm glad you said this time around because I'm no stranger to St. Lucia. I'm here as an eco consultant looking at climate smart agriculture. There's a regional project on that's uh, facilitated by ECA and IFAD, which is the International Foundation for Agricultural Development. And I'm here to ostensibly just get a pulse for what the response has been like to climate change within the agricultural sector. And what have you found out thus far? Well, uh, without uh, letting the cat out of the bag too much, I, I found out that the impacts here are similar to what I've found in, in St. Vincent and, and St. Kitts and Nevis. It's primarily driven by lack of rainfall, the increased uh, unpredictability of the weather. And I want to take this opportunity to say that it matters not whether you think it's actually climate change or weather variability. Whatever is happening, is happening now. So we need to do something now. We need to do something now about it. So I found that mostly we're talking about increased heat, heat stress, um, unpredictability of the rainfall, um, poor food set, a whole range of, of issues. But it's not all bad news. There are a lot of really good things going on, and I hope during the course of the program you'll be able to talk about some. mission that you're going to be gathering here in St. Lucia and perhaps throughout the region, what really is the ultimate plan? The, the ultimate plan is that uh, the IFAD, the International Foundation for Agricultural Development, is considering developing a regional project. But this project is going to be geared towards satisfying felt needs out there. And we are taking the pulse of the, of the, of the farming population and the, and the population generally. Because I want to re-emphasize that climate smart agriculture is not about the agricultural sector. Climate smart agriculture is about the country. Because every single person is affected by what happens with climate change and with the agricultural sector. I, I, I've found far too often that uh, in, in conversations like these, nationally televised conversations like these, there's a tendency to believe that we are talking about agriculture. We are talking about life in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're a hotelier and you're sitting there thinking, well, if there's not enough local production, we'll probably import it. You're, you're facing an industry that is sensitive to climate change. You have airport passenger taxes now, and people know that they're paying extra money to mitigate, to, to, to nullify the impact of their flying. They don't want to eat food that flew the same distance they did. So the whole concept of food miles is putting, additional, putting an additional flip to agricultural production. So that's why I said the news isn't all bad. I mean, you know, we're being forced to look now at local production, not just from an economic standpoint, but from an environmental and, and, and climate change standpoint as well. So there, as I said, there's some, it's a mixed bag. And I think that what will come out of all of this is a project that will address some of the concerns, whether it be in better methods of harvesting water because rainwater harvesting is, is at the top of the agenda in all islands, all islands, because all our agriculture is rainfall driven. Mm -hmm. You know, we, the island territories do not have lakes and, you know, and, and standing bodies of water so that low rainfall, no recharge of those springs or no recharge of your, of your dams, that's it. You know, we, we, we're in real trouble. I'm Steve, I want you to speak a little more just to the thing from where you left off. The idea of food security and nutritional security and not the same what is the difference between the two and what how significant is that in, in terms of the yes, way forward I, uh, this is a particular hobby horse for me i i i i have serious difficulty with all this talk about food security that is devoid of any discussion on nutrition because if we stick to the traditional definition of food security and calorific intake uh, a 2000 calorie diet can be obtained from and taste of drinks, I suppose, mm -hmm. and, and, and a proper meal. Mm -hmm. And I think nutrition security deals with getting the proper nutrition, getting those calories from the right sources, not getting them from the so-called empty calories, mm -hmm. sugar and, and all your, your, your proponents of NCDs, your non-communicable diseases and so. So that it's, it's a very involved discussion. Um, in my consultancy, I am dealing 
primarily with the nutritional aspects, with the health aspects, not just the agricultural sector. The people I'm interviewing here in St. Lucia would include the chief nutritionist, Lisa Hunt Mitchell, a whole range of people because I, we recognize, ECA and IFAD recognizes that climate smart agriculture is just good agricultural practices. I was also happy to hear Cleta say that you know, we're going back to our roots. It's, it's just a sexy name because that is where the funding is. And I, I, we have to be realistic. You know, the climate smart agriculture is just good old fashioned, good agricultural practices where you didn't waste water, where you compost it. And another hobby horse I have is composting. If you give, give me one second to, to talk about that, because uh -huh. I, in my working in 13 CARICOM, 14 CARICOM countries, my big disappointment has been that what we call composting here in the region is really collecting scraps at the back of your yard. You know, people tell you, oh, I have a compost. No, you have a rat apartment. Mm -hmm. You know, once you put scraps of meat and so on, you know, and you don't turn it properly, it's a properly set, you're not really composting. You, you have glorified mulch maybe, but you're not composting. And I think we need to spend more time doing proper composting. Uh, I'm, I'm familiar with some countries where the solid waste management company is now providing compost. So you come around, they come around, all your tree cuttings and so, you put them on the side of the road, you get the solid waste management people to chip it and turn it into compost, and then you go back and buy that. Because mm -hmm. one of the things that used to upset me in, in the old days is to go to upscale supermarkets and see middle class people buying horse manure from Canada. You know, it's right. flower grow. It's called flower grow, but it's already horse manure in a bag. Right. And they're putting that right next to their groceries, you know, and everybody is very comfortable to do that. <laughs> but they're, they're, they're not prepared to buy, to buy locally produced compost because uh -huh. you know, it came from rubbish, you know, and, and that, that kind of issue. So that it affords us quite an opportunity now under the rubric of climate smart mm -hmm. agriculture, which is where the funding is, <laughs> to be able to do the traditional things. Okay. And I, I really want to yeah. compliment yeah. Kitas at, on, on reminding us about that. All right. In the last 25 seconds, based on what you're here to do, based on the, the forecast, uh, what would you like to, to leave us with? I would like to leave a, 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 a positive message. I think we are, we are still in the reaction mode. I think we, we're getting closer to proactive a, a movement within the sector where we are actually looking to implement some of the things that Kita spoke about. I just wanted to mention that although not everything from overseas is good, you know, consultants included, we, <laughs> we, 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 have, to, we have to be sure. We have to be sure that there, there are climate analogs. There, there are parts of the world where they are going through these types of stresses that we are predict predicted to have, and, mm -hmm. and I know Cardi has been doing a lot of work with bringing in varieties from, from the, the South Pacific, etc. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's not always that we're going to be looking to, to look inwards, you know, there are times when we're going to be using improved germplasm from elsewhere. Okay, we've got to round up. This is Amisha Doxery. Until another time, bye-bye. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for continuing your chatting. Yeah, 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 yeah. involved in the rearing of livestock need to think of the intention of government to give the required attention to all levels of education from the branch. In practice.